Hello, Saint. You are now listening to the teaching sermon from the God Life Assembly Just by Pastor Chindok Ishako. Remain blessed as you listen. Take us by the hand, lead us to the wisdom that laid the foundations of the earth. Show us the pillars where she stands. And reveal to us the life by which she was designed to exist. Lord, help the stewards of this life. Help us compel all creation to arise to this life. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Quickly, as we greet each other, please help me. Everything else, just sit here. All right, just here. Pastors, front row. The people from the second row here. Let's go. Just these two, these two arms, just between here and here. Right. So that I can have access to everyone. Then everyone who comes in later. Feeling the seats. Amen. While you do that, make sure you reach out to someone. Greet them. Love upon them. Let them know. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Ah. Remember, you're a pastor. Come on, stand here. My friend, we got to They are watching you all over the world. Viewers all over the world. Look at your screen. No, you just sit down there now. I thought that was where you wanted to sit down. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. I've missed you. I know you did not miss me, but it's fine. It's not okay. It's all right. It's all right. It's good to not miss me. Amen. Zoe, that's not in the regions I gave. Zion, you are out of my region. Come out. Come. Come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Glory to God. Then just come on, come, 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 come. I should have an usher by the door. Funom, let me have an usher by the door so that you take it from there. Amen. Glory to God. Good evening, church. Have you been since I left you? Ah, hey, Jesus Christ. The question was in English. Oh, have you been? Okay, blessed be God. It's good to see you. But I'm not the man of God for the hour. My wife is preaching tonight. Amen. And I might, I might preach a little less between now and come meeting. I'll be around, but um, I intend to enter into seclusion. Because there are many things in my spirit to deal with. So I thought to lay the foundation for the night. You were going to the back. You were hoping you had been delivered. You wasn't going to the back. Okay. Praise God. All right. Um, 
I thought to leave behind a thought. I thought to leave behind a thought um, that should drive our thinking from now till possibly till camp. Amen. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. I read two, three, four scriptures. Um, I need 40 minutes to do all this, I believe. All right? 126 from verse 1. When the Lord again, when the Lord turned again the captive, we were like them dream. Technica. Good evening. Thank you. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord had done great things for them. Verse 3. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall what? Doubtless come again, what? With rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All right. So I started to consider this verse of scripture from a slightly different perspective, especially because I read in verse 1 that the Bible says, when God turned again the captivity of Zion. When God turned again the captivity of Zion. When God turned again the captivity of Zion. Now, reading when God turned again the captivity of Zion, did something to me. I sat... That love me. Thank you. All right. Jesus captive. All right. He has broken the gates of brass. He has caught the bars of iron in sunder. There are not too many things that have the permission to touch, as it were, the joy of Zion. All right? And so I look within the context of the New Testament and I realize that there is only, and I was teaching this in me now Sunday evening, there's only one thing that has the right to touch the emotion. Of those of us who dwell in Zion now. Why? Peace I live with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Give I thee. Alright? Um, so, please hear me. While we are dealing with the instabilities of the soul. Which is what we have done a lot of this year. Alright? Because the Lord said to us. Refresh, restart. He restores my soul. And while we are dealing with the instabilities of the soul. Um, and we're speaking things like peace by all means. We're speaking things like peace in the midst of the storm. And we're studying and considering the Lord Jesus and how stable he was in his soul to the degree to which there was no external circumstance that seemed to be able to move him, that seemed to be able to destabilize him. There were only a few times you found that scripture suggested that the Lord Jesus was touched emotionally, all right? One of those few times was when John the Baptist was killed, all right? And when John the Baptist was killed, the Bible says he withdrew himself alone to a solitary place and he stayed there for a little while. So you could tell that um, it wasn't a pain of a friend or relative dying. It was a, the reality of the fact that this same system that just killed John is going to take me. All right? Are you following me? And so the Lord Jesus, um, in the face of the possibilities of what could befall his natural self, I'll, I'll teach a bit of, of this in camp meeting or soon at time, because I've said, if you listen to me in Zaria and in Mina, I promised a lot of things for camp meeting. So the camp meeting is already full. So now when I'm saying I'm going to teach something in camp meeting, I'm thinking which camp meeting? This year or next year? Sometime or never? Amen. So my wife said we will have post-camp. All right. So she's planning a retreat that will post-camp. That one you have to pay me for it. Amen. Praise God. But
Mommy, see that do. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, so please listen to this very carefully. Let's, let's just follow me very carefully. So, in considering these things, I realized, like I said, there were not too many things that could touch the emotional threshold of the Lord Jesus. Apart from that was when you heard Jesus wept. And every Bible student knows that Jesus did not weep because John the Baptist, uh, Lazarus was dead. Jesus wept because he was looking for faith and there was none that had faith. Because he couldn't be weeping for the one he was about to raise. It was them who interpreted and said, ah, behold how he loved him. And many times our humanity seems to give us uh, an interpretation of things from the standpoint of our emotions. And one of the things that, please don't take this for granted, one of the things that you must pray between now and camp meeting is that the Lord truly restores your soul. And in the restoration of the soul, what happens is that you arrive at proving that nothing has the right to shift your emotional base unless it affects God's kingdom. Come on, amen. Those are things you need to pray. Because Jesus already promised you that in this world you will have tribulation. But in me you will have peace. This is how I said unto you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But rejoice because I have overcome the world. That means if you are not standing from the standpoint of the overcomer, what happens naturally is that what troubles the world will trouble you. And it's obvious that the generation he's coming to rapture, the generation he's coming to collect, cannot be affected by natural circumstances. It's very obvious in scripture. Time will fail us to describe it. It's obvious. And now more than ever before, I am reminded that I have to step above the threshold of my humanity. And part of the reasons why I'm entering into a season of some kind of silence or seclusion is because I am conscious that Hebrews chapter 5 said that he was heard because he feared. You don't hear that kind of day coming and then just think that your humanity will give way. Naturally, even if the Lord bequeaths to you that inheritance, it will be tested. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you decide that you are not going to be living as a human being anymore, and everything about your natural being has been cultured to be human. Even when the Lord bequeaths that inheritance to you, what happens is that you'll be tested. And in the, in the day of your testing, your soul will still be intact. So the Bible said that in the days of his flesh, and I'm coming there because that's where I'm going to when I went to he that saw it in tears. All right? That in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And if you have heard me before, I'll take the time at Camp BT or Post Camp to explain this properly. But if you have heard me before, I had said very clearly that the death that he was afraid of was not the cross. Was not the cessation of life. It was, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That means the death Jesus was afraid of is the death that makes people die, which is sin. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus was afraid that the next set of demands that the Father was going to put on him was going to test his will at a capacity that nothing had ever tested his will. And he was, Jesus was not so confident that standing in front of that test, he was going to say yes to the father. So three hours of grinding in Gethsemane was actually a consideration of the soul. And in that place was fear that was gripping Jesus consistently of the tendencies of his humanity and how that if he permits a manifestation of those tendencies, he will cut short the purposes of God, which is the release of eternal life on a new generation. So imagine how costly on both sides. His choice was a costly choice because of how much it was going to cost him. But what it is going to cost if he fails at that choice was too high. And sometimes you have to stand in that season where a singular decision 
about your life. It's about to affect your generation and your generations after you. And in that, you don't, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't ever enter that kind of season confidently. Some level of trepidation should come to your heart. Not the fear of Satan. Not the fear of circumstances. Not even the fear of outcomes. But the fear of the possibilities that still abound in your flesh. Knowing that if God does not do something about your humanity, you will fail. So who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong cryings and tears. That's what Gethsemane represented. He cried with strong tears unto the one that was able to deliver him from death. And the Bible says, and he was hurt because he feared. Now, if the death that he was praying to be del delivered from was the cross, and the Bible says he was hurt, then he shouldn't have died. Do you understand it? Because every prayer God hears, he answers. And Jesus had already prayed just before Gethsemane and said to the Father, Lord, I'm not asking that you take them away from the world because I know what is coming. He had just finished declaring what was coming to them. He said, but I'm not asking that you take them away from the world, but that you keep them in it. Is anybody following me? We are stewarding seasons, not only for ourselves, not only for the God Life Assembly, but for this generation. That's how serious where we stand feels like to me. That's why my threshold for many things are too short. But then I'm also reminded that in the night when the Lord Jesus needed to war this war, nobody could stand with him. Not only did they abandon him and run away and deny him that night, but even when it was time to pray the prayers, they did not understand the depth of what was at stake. So they could not tie. And so you don't blame the people, Pastor Lisbeth. Because when people don't know the implication of a season, you can ask them to fast. And by two o'clock, they think they should enter a corner and find something to eat. Because they don't even understand why we're fasting for 10 days before camp meeting. That allow all this religion. If somebody will even call his friend aside to explain to him why it is religious so that he can get a partner who will go and break fast with him. But you don't blame them. But neither should they blame us for being on the edge with that behavior because even the Lord was exasperated. He turned out and he said to them, ah, ah, can't you tarry with me for one hour? He was in Gethsemane three hours. What you are saying is, even if you don't understand the burden, will you not just say for one hour, Lord, please help, help that guy? Even if it's religion, because he has taken this thing too seriously, he keeps telling us he will die, all this day we come for him, all of this day, but just help him. Like I said, you can't blame disciples. They possibly... No matter how hard he... Do, do you now understand why when he met them on the road to Emma Osaka, do you realize the reason why the first thing he said, resurrected Jesus, oh fools, and hard of heart to understand. That means this is not likely the first time that I'm trying to explain this thing to you. But humanity has kept you bound in seeing life only from where you stand. I told those of you who were here a few weeks ago that the Holy Ghost said to me, now you are raising a new a pure grain. And you possibly didn't even ask what's the implication of that. The Holy Ghost wasn't saying we were wasting our time all along. No. What he's saying is, you have now arrived at the threshold. Heaven now considers you serious. So hell also considers you serious. And these kinds of seasons 
are not stewarded by the arm of flesh. Because it won't be by power, it won't be by might, it will be by the Spirit. So if Jesus saw a season that made him fear and made him lie down inside Gethsemane for three hours, the concoctment of the thoughts inside of him made the sweat that was dripping from him tick. Now, do, you, do you know how much it takes for sweat to come out of your natural body? I sweat naturally. I mean, sweating is nothing for me. For me. Me. Sweating is nothing for me. I can sweat inside ice. All I need is a little of activity. That's why, if you see almost all of my action pictures, I'm carrying a hanky on one hand. Somebody outside Nigeria sent me a text. He said, sir, I want to understand. You seem to always be carrying a hanky. I just started laughing. That was when it actually dawned on me that almost every picture I have on a stage has a handkerchief with it. So these days, I'm trying to avoid it. Even if I clean my face, I drop it. So some people will not think that that's where I have the powers. It's my habit to shake Are you with me? I said that to say, I sweat naturally. But it takes activity to sweat. A man cannot be lying down on his face in one spot and sweating. <laughs> a man couldn't have fallen on his face. Because the Bible told you that he fell on his face to pray. A man can't fall down on his face in one spot and be sweating. And the thickness of the sweat was like, it was like drops of blood. What was he thinking of that discombobulated his system to the degree? It wasn't spiritual. It was the intensity of the attack on his mind. I told my wife a few days ago, I said, I've been there in a small measure. I know what it means for Satan to sit on a stool and decide your mind. I'll get it. He lifts up everything that has the tendency to put you under pressure and makes the reality so close that have you ever feel have you ever felt besieged? Do you know what it means to be besieged? That you are in a place where every and any action you make can implicate you. And Satan sets a garrison. Leave it. So if the Lord Jesus lay down in one place and he was sweating, you should be asking, what's the contention? The contention was not, he had not done anything wrong. No. The contention was, the amount of price that God is asking me to pay. I have the right not to pay it. Because I have not sinned, I do not deserve death. And if death, not death of this kind. Because everything man knew, I had to pay for it. He had to pay for the shame in the nakedness and the humiliation. Imagine Jesus who celebrated all over Israel. Running Israel in pants. They lifted him up on the cross. Tore his clothes. He was bare, stark naked. It's decency that makes that they show you the picture now. They put a napkin around him. I was looking at people whose children, uncles, cousins, he healed. Spitting on his face. And what happened in Gethsemane was that God permitted him to travel the full length of that journey. Because you will see in John chapter 5 and John 17 that when God loves a man, what he does is that he reveals what he's doing to the man. So God permitted Jesus to walk the full length of the journey till the point of his death and come back and ask him, will you drink it? 
So when you hear, never delays. Not my will. This is wait, wait. You think Jesus entered Gethsemane shouting, never delays. That never delays that was written in scripture was most likely the last statement he made in prayer. It was three hours of groaning and contemplation. It was three hours of weeping. Don't forget that where I'm coming from is when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion. And I'm saying to you that if peace at all costs is something to go by, if it is anything to go by, then the captivity of Zion cannot be anything natural. Cannot be, ah, I've suffered too much. Now God has broken through for me. You can interpret it at that level, but not tonight. Now, so a few reasons why you cannot interpret it like that tonight. Even if you don't understand this, take it in. We are at the threshold of something as a church. We are at the threshold of something. How long we will tarry in this space, I don't know. We might have to tarry long for it. But we have to repeat the saying of it and keep believing it together. And if I have a prayer, is that nobody will fall, out, fall away. If I have a prayer, we are at the threshold of something. We are pushing the doors of life are pushing the boundaries of the workings of eternal life. And I believe that the next phase of eternal life that must be revealed on the earth is critical for the days of the trial of the church. And I also believe that the days of the trial of the church are not too far from here. The Bible calls it the great tribulation which shall come upon the whole earth. I believe that those days are not far. And I believe that the present operation of life that we have found cannot sustain that day. And I believe that we have found the privilege by God to pray into a next operation of life. And I'm rejoicing because we are beginning to find tiny little tokens here and there that say to us that God is serious about this thing. If you read Faith Adventures, I spoke there a lot about what I call the consolations of faith. And the consolations of faith is not an arrival at faith. You cannot use the consolations of faith to say, yeah, we're finally arrived. But God gives you the consolations of faith so that you can know that your pursuit is valid. I went to Zaya and I found a few testimonies. I left a few testimonies myself here. But I went to Zaya and I found a few testimonies. Really encouraging. We are just finished talking about this life. Now, if you know what they do in Zaria now, if they want to collect your phone, they come with magic. Then they hit you so that you can let go of the phone. And the matches are normally sharp. It's not, they are not playing with you. We had just finished discussing eternal life. And one of the guys who wasn't even a church member, just came from campus, was walking back to school. And then he said they came on a bike. And they held the machete. They hit him three times. Bah! 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 There was no scar on his body. And I said to myself, yeah, yeah, we're getting close. No scar. No, not, no scratch. There was no sign. I said to myself, oh, yeah, we're getting close. And they told me the story of one of our girls. They actually live in Pastor Ben's house. The people who lived together with her had gone ahead. They had reached Paladan to cross and go to the house. She was crossing from the rail. You know Zaria Church. She was crossing from the rail to the other side. And she was saying, ah, I'm late too. 
the Lord helps me get home. Then she crossed to the other side and met her housemates on the other side of the road in Paladin. Leave it. I'm, I'm saying this to you so that you understand that God is giving us signs. There are tokens that God is beginning to bring. And for me, those tokens are consolations. Those tokens are beginning to speak to us about possibilities that have not been embraced yet by the human mind that we must become familiar with because it will become necessary for our operation not many days from now. And yet, I know that we will not enter the fullness of it until we pass through a curtain that both speaks about heaven's approval and Satan's testing. Oof. It's beginning to come in little measures. I've seen my own here and there. But you know when it comes to these things, I'd rather not talk about me. Uh, see mine here and there. So, hear this. Like I said to you, I am conscious that there's a threshold of humanity that we must pass. And if it's a threshold of humanity that we must pass, Gethsemane is the recommendation. And if Gethsemane is the recommendation, fear is the accompaniment. And that fear is not the fear of terror. It's not even the fear of failure. It's the consciousness of the possibility that our humanity binds us down to. Is somebody still here? Come on, saints. Is somebody still here? Now, I said that so that I can go back to my scripture. When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion. Now, whatever this captivity is, definitely it made us cry. Is that correct? Because next verse, the Bible says, then was our mouth filled with laughter. That means before that time, laughter was far from us. Right? And if laughter is far from us, okay, if laughter is far from us, it means that mourning became our companion. Is that correct? Come on now, come on. It means that mourning became our companion. Is that correct? Uh -huh. So, um, I want you to, somewhere in the back of your mind, just keep there, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, right? And right in that back of your mind, still keep the fact that the Bible says, in this we do grow earnestly desire. I took the time in closing the session in Mina Church on Sunday evening to say to them that every groaning in the New Testament is bound to the manifestation of eternal life. There's, ne there's not the mention of the word groan in the New Testament that is bound to anything natural. That means that heaven expects that the only things that can destabilize you is the absence of the things that are divine. Hmm? So if I find what is possible in God, that it's not operational in my life. That's what is supposed to trouble me. Jesus went to the base essentials and he said, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, where you shall be clothed. And he cannot be saying that to people who are rich enough to take care of themselves. That means he's saying that even in your barest state of lack, heaven still does not expect that you are worried about your life. I said that to first establish because to get the interpretation I'm looking for out of this scripture tonight, we have to first remove the possibility of anything natural. Because if we don't undo, and I'm not saying if you use it for anything natural, you have done wrong. No. I'm saying that for where we are going to, first, let us agree that in the New Testament, nothing is supposed to worry you. Now, in the midst of that agreement, for the sake of those of you who might not fully understand what I'm saying, let me break this down a little. So Paul says in Philippians 4, be anxious. Hmm? 
So nothing should be able to destabilize you. Then he said, Okay, praise God. Let's go, let's go. So this thing doesn't distract us. Now, I need to understand that when Paul said, be anxious for nothing, nothing means what? He said, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. That means, Paul acknowledges here that saying be anxious for nothing will not stop you from being anxious. But it tells you the ideal state. Do you understand it? Now I'm saying that to say that don't think that when we speak like this, we are speaking unrealistically because even God knows. No, even God knows it's not the approved standard. So if I'm still living in less than the approved standard, I must first accept in my heart that I'm living less than the approved standard. So that I don't condemn the approved standard by my experience. Are you following me? Jesus accused the Pharisees of making the word of God of non-effect by their tradition. I'm going, that one I'll surely teach it in community this year. It tells you that when anything becomes a culture, when it becomes a tradition, what it does is that it holds down the possibility of anything going above that threshold for the people who embrace that culture. Are you following me? And one of the things that you must know that God is intent on doing with us in this season is he has to break the cultures that hold our mind by what scripture recommends as be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means there are certain things that human beings have said are impossible. That you read the Bible and they are possible. But you have never arrived at believing it is possible with you. Because that's how bad culture is. So 2 Corinthians 3 says to you, Till now, when the law is read, the veil remains untaken. That veil is culture. Because we cannot insist on the culture of the divine until we undo the culture of time. Are you following me? You, is, is, see, you cannot, I, I took time early this year to explain it to you. You can't put new wine in old wine skins. Neither can you mix new and old wine in the same wine skin. So the first tough assignment is to even arrive at believing that you are who God says you are. It's to arrive at believing that you live at the level that God says you live at. It's to arrive at believing. Are you with me, saints? Come on, saints. Are you still with me? You look very angry. I think I should travel again. Are you all right? Don't worry, for I told you, this is very likely going to be my last major teaching before camp meeting. Me too, I want to enter one small coro. I'll be around. You'll be seeing me. I'll be here. I just, I sit down here and cack. Are you following me? So this for me is, if you can remember, if you can bear it, this for me is releasing on you my burdens so that I will enter into camp meeting justified. Do you understand it? Do you understand it? Uh, so that there's nothing God has committed to me that I've not poured upon you. So today is my attempt to pour into you the things that trouble me. Uh, so that if you don't use them to pray, I can't help you. 
And even God will not judge me. He will know that what he committed to me, I committed to you. So that you and I together can enter into the days that I had must know. Amen? Now, so I said, for the sake of those of you who think that we are being unrealistic, all right? And whether in the house or watching online or who get to, you know, interface with these materials later. Hear this. So, it means that Paul acknowledges that saying be anxious for nothing does not stop you from being anxious. Because he said, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Meaning, he knows that that means he's now giving you the solution for anxiety. So, if anxiety pops up, what you must use is prayer. Alright? So, let me add this to it, which is what I've been trying to say since early morning. Since early in the morning, when I started trying to speak. That means that anxiety, number one, is not the normal state of a believer. Are you following me? That becoming even anxious and then anxiety drives your prayer is not even God's normal state for you. That that is a pathway to bring you to the place where anxiety has nothing on you. That means if anything can touch your emotion at that level, it has to have God in the center of it. Because God did not design us emotionless. That means the anxiety itself has a need. That's why God created you with it. And the true need of that anxiety is for you to feel the urgency of divine times and seasons. That's the true use of anxiety. So what you must understand now is that it is the fall that spills your anxiety to natural things. Are you following me? And solid food belongs to mature who by means of use. That means becoming conscious that this is not normal makes that every time Satan attacks you with anxiety, you find it as an opportunity for exercise. So I'm exercising myself to be less anxious because with every next satanic attempt to make me anxious, I know that it is time to pray and exercise my muscles so that the next time this kind of thing shows up, the first sign that I've grown above it is that anxiety will not escort it. Does it make sense? At that point, my anxiety is totally now preserved for the things that are divine. At that point, my mourning is totally preserved for the things that are divine. Are you with me? So you hear Jesus saying on the cross, don't weep for me. Weep for your children. Imagine. Imagine the kind of pain he had been through. Anybody in that state is looking for the slightest comfort, the small pity, any action of love that should satisfy. I'm reading John now again. And I'm hearing how emotionless Jesus sounds. It's very annoying. <sighs> Women love you. They defied, even your disciples could not stand there. But they defied the Roman system, defied the temple system, came to the foot of the cross and were crying there. <sighs> what does he know? then the person they are crying for is the one speaking. Did you notice that there was no point in those 12 to 16 hours that Jesus was brutally handled? There was no point that Jesus sounded pitiable. He collected every conversation and led it. With blood on his forehead. He was asking Pilate. Pilate said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Then he asked Pilate, what are you st stupid question? Do you know the question Jesus asked him? He said, are you speaking by yourself or did people tell you? You that they caught, they are beating. They brought you to me so that I can sentence you to death. That means your life is in my hand. In natural context. 
Then I'm asking, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus asked him, are you speaking for yourself or are you reiterating what they told you? Then the man asked him, am I a Jew? Then Jesus said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if my kingdom was of this world, all this rubbish would not be happening. My followers will have resisted this thing. That means what he was actually saying is that you see these 12 disciples that we mean get so many. The backup we had. Do you understand it? How do you know the backup? It's the backup he spoke to Peter about. If I will, now I will ask the father. So Jesus was standing in front of Pilate. There was no moment where he was anxiously asking for his life. Like that loud guy, that alive, they say, wait, please. That loud, look at me, I'm very innocent. Pilate couldn't understand what kind of man was standing in front of him. You. Is your salary they didn't pay complete? Remaining 10,000. Every office you can knock, you have knocked like a beggar. Are you? Are you is anybody understanding? You know when I do those kind of examples, it is God. There's somebody seated here whose salary was not paid complete. I can't. Ah. I know when I'm being a prophet. Come on, saints. Are we on the same page? Are you understanding? Come, come on now. Are you understanding? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So there was no moment where Jesus felt like he should be pitied. Worst of now beaten, battered, on top of cross, dripping blood. Then he saw women cry. Sir, if you cannot comfort them, leave them to cry their cry, sir. Jesus had to look at those innocent, innocent women. I said, don't weep for me. Let me tell you the truth. There's a scripture in John chapter 6 I want to read today. To follow Jesus is not easy. I... If it's Jesus you want to follow, well, life is not easy. People think that he's loving and the interpretation of his loving means that he's all cozy. Ah, you're right. You are fine. When he answers you, one sarcastic answer. I don't know anybody that has the amount of sarcasm. No, if you know, if you know literature, go and read the scripture. Jesus answers with his intestines. So if you, because he had to declare truth on every level. So if you followed him, you have to be convinced of his love beyond his words. How do you look at women, innocent women? Don't cry for me. Cry for your children. Hey. Ah. Weep for yourself. Oh, you even say yourself first. Hey. So, let's go back to Psalm 146. I think I've stayed here long enough. Have I? I said 40 minutes, but that means I spent like 7 minutes now. Eh? Like seven minutes, ba? Yeah, I believe her. You can believe anything. I'm telling you. No, I mean Jesus or not. You can believe anything on the streets. Now, I was saying that to say that whatever caused them to mourn at this level, if the reference is Zion, then it couldn't have been it was a captivity. Alright? And in my present interpretations, that captivity is the limitation of the flesh, the limitation of the body. All right? And I can borrow from Paul in Romans chapter 8. And he said, not only do creation grow, but we ourselves grow. 
who are the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan within ourselves, looking forward to the redemption of our bodies. That means we want to be set free from that. Ooh. To this I owe, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I. What to Christ in me? To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I. What to Christ in me. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I. What to Christ in me. So there's a limitation. It's a bondage. You guys get that. We'll sing it when, when I finish. It's a bondage. And every time we remember that we're still bound to it, it's a captivity we need to be set free from. And the dream is that when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Have you ever sat down to imagine what you will be like? When the limitation of the body is broken. Well, lie, even now it's a dream. Not to talk about then. Then you remember how limited you used to be. Then see how Christ has set you free. So I took that to say. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the hidden. That means the hidden could see it. That the Lord had done us great things. The Lord has done us great things wherein we are glad. That means we will not know joy until this is done. I, do, I hope you understand what I just said. Hmm? Nothing can satisfy us. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future show the price it has been paid. For oh, Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I owe my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but to Christ in me. To this I owe, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but true Christ in me. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but true Christ in me. Look at this. Ah, you guys stay there. Stay home. Stay, stay. Stay. That's my song for the night. In fact, that's our hymn for Sunday. Esther. Are you following me? So when the Lord turned again our captivity, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue would sing it. 
The hidden said, the Lord has done great things. We too said, the Lord has done great things. Then he said, turn again our captivity like the streams of the south. Then the plot of this chapter of scripture starts the beginning from the end. I wish you heard me. So what was left in the last two verses of Psalm 126 is the pattern of the breaking of this cap captivity. Are you following me? So if that chapter of scripture should have started, it should have started with verse 5. 5. Verse 5. What? Oh. oh, you have not even seen the verse 5. Media. Good evening, no. They that sow in tears. See, please hold your Bible close to you so that. Uh -huh. So, as I said, the verse 5, even you, you have, you have now, you are now depending on technology. So, all of you are just waiting for the verse 5. Instead of it to even be looking, just even pretend that you are looking for it. Are we together? What they should have said from the beginning is they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, rejoicing. That means this joy and laughter that you find in our mouths is a harvest. And the harvest is a harvest of a seed we consistently sowed. But we were sowing that seed while we were mourning. Are you following me? This is going to be short, but you'll understand it. So you now understand why Galatians chapter 6 said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. That means you must understand that you cannot be looking forward to a day and not be sowing the seeds for it. Are you following me? It was the seeds for that day that John recommended as loving your brother. He said because whoever has, who hates his brother has no eternal life abiding in him. Then he said to you, if what you are looking for is life, know that you are passed from death to life because you love the bread. That means you must understand that every exercise of faith that is given to you, especially in the practice of love, is supposed to be a sowing looking for a harvest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the harvest you seek to reap when you sow love is eternal life. So when I bear you, Pastor Onismos, it's never about you. Yes, do I love you? Yes, I do. Jesus commanded me to. But you know what? Who for the joy said before him endured the cross. So the strength to go through enduring the days of my contradiction is because I know this good action that I'm doing will not only redeem my brother, it is buying eternal life for me. I wish you heard me. So the Bible said to you, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Then he said, if you sow to the flesh, on the bakaroziata, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. That means everything that is done with, from the standpoint of the flesh can only multiply death. Because corruption here is death. He said, or if you sow to the spirit, what? So if eternal life is what you are looking for, what you sow will tell us. And you sow it what? Weeping. Aye. So all week, my scripture was John chapter 6. It is the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. I've had to say to myself a million and one times that every action I take in the flesh has no profit. But every action I take in the spirit is tearing up the quickening of life. We need to study this John 6 1. Give me the John 6 1 from verse 58. John 6. Look at this. Ah, thank you, Lord. What I'm saying to you now is so in tears, so in tears, so in tears. Eh? Do you remember the last set of scriptures I read to you? Romans chapter 2, verse 7. Do you remember Romans 2, 7? Oh, 
Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. This is the kind of that I used to discourage preacher. Do you remember in 1, 2, 7? Two people say yes, sir. Them through whom patient continuance in well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality, what will be their reward? Hey, hey. So what are they looking for? Glory, honor, and immortality. What must they continue doing? Patient continuance in well-doing. That means the seed to sow is patient continuance in well-doing. So if I do it to you and you don't say thank you, I can't be angry. Because thank you is not what I'm looking for. Eternal life. Is anybody hearing me? If you despitefully use me, the reason I explained it in Zaya, the reason why I can let you walk away is because I wasn't looking for your respect. Your despite is even helping me. Because what I was looking for is eternal life. So I took the time yeah, to explain to them that if Jesus said, if they collect, borrow that jacket, if they collect your jacket, eh, I collected your jacket by force. Scripture says you should remove your t-shirt and give me. You see, I didn't collect the t-shirt. You removed it. If I force you to go one mile, and I say, hey, okay, now you can go. Then you follow me a second mile. No, did you see? Then the Bible says, if I slap you on this side, bah! Notice that each of the second actions were deliberately decided by you. And to deliberately decide the second slap or the second lap of that action is to understand what the action is birthing for you. The only way you can go the second length is to understand that this thing is ripping, is... So it's working eternal life in me. So when you are removing the shirt to add to the jacket, it's not because it is feeling sweet. It's because you understand that that press in your soul, that, that press in your soul is the working of eternal life. I told them, Yimina, the Bible says, broad is the road and wide is the path that leads to death, not to hell. Then the Bible says, straight is the road and narrow is the path that leads to life, not to heaven. Do you understand it? And I started singing an old song we used to sing. Because back in the day we thought it was heaven. Now when I say heaven, I know what I mean. It's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart. It's a highway to heaven. I'm walking up the king's highway. It's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart is a highway to heaven. I'm walking up the king's highway. So if I feel depressed, what I should ask you? Highway. Do you understand the high? It's not, it's not the picture of the song. When I shout it, it's instead of, ah! Are you following? So everything that squeezes my soul now, what you it's a high word. So that I remind my soul that what you are gaining by this is eternal life. That way, you will stop fighting your cause. That way, you stop trying to prove anything to anybody. Because my conclusion is that whatever squeezes my soul at that level, the only thing that can come out is eternal life. Why? Every squeeze is causing me to go forth weeping. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. 
So if I sow to the flesh, that means every weepet, I either decide to sow into eternal life or rebel against eternal life by seeking my right. That's why love is the way to victory. I, I said it before I left. If you go and read John's letters again, don't come for camp meeting until you have finished all of John's letters. Read John, then read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, then go back to John. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, then go back to John. You realize that the entire subject that John spoke about was life. Was eternal life. You'll find out nobody spoke about love like John. Nobody spoke about life like John. But they were not two disconnected things. John spoke about love as a pathway to life. It's a highway to hell. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart, it's a highway to heaven. I'm walking up the king's highway. It's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart, it's a highway to heaven. I'm walking up the king's highway. Say it again. It's a highway to hell. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart. It's a highway to hell. I'm walking up the king's highway. Say one more time. It's a highway to hell. None can walk up there. But the pure in heart. It's a highway to hell. Walking up the king's highway. So look at these three scriptures quickly as I take my seat. This is what I came to show you. That the season we are in is the season to sow. Sow. Sow now and sow in tears. I hope you heard me. Sow now and sow in tears. If you heard me tonight, you know that this is the second instruction I'm giving. Because there's a season in front of you. Fear must accompany you. So tonight is fear and tears. They are even a rhyme, so it's easy for you to remember. What are you afraid of? You are afraid of your human tendency and the possibility of it resisting the purposes of God. And if I stretch that, I would tell you, whatever guard you need to put around yourself, put that guard. Honor everyone who puts the guard that insists on keeping you on the pathway of the spirit. Even if you know I have the tendency in this season to mess up things. So I brought myself. Don't bring yourself after you have messed up. Because I'm afraid of my tendencies, I understand now that I must fortify the fences that are around me. I must have people that I can call, like those three disciples who Jesus went to Gethsemane with. Even if they don't understand, let them at least hear and bear the burdens of your seasons. Because what will happen is that because we have placed a demand for eternal life, there's a cutting of trial that we must pass through. I've told you before it comes. And in that trial, that trial will come in different dimensions. Some of the things you thought you had overcome and have buried will show up again. Then you realize that Jesus left him for another opportune season. So this season, you by yourself, fast. Are you following me? God did not suggest fast to Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Eh. He didn't do it because he found what the prophet said. He knew that the declaration of divine approval opens before you a season of the test. And to prepare for the test, you have to consciously lean up your soul in fastings. You understand it? And don't only fast food. Fast anything that has the tendency of stirring up those portions of humanity that Satan is coming for. Because guess what? The fasting will not take away the temptation. It will prepare you for it. Because after 40 days, when you are unhungered, And part of the hunger is not just lack of food. Part of the hunger is that that desire has been starved. So if it's a pride of place, do you understand? It's a pride of place. And this person, I must be recognized as this. You fast it. That's what I told my before she left the house. I said, I don't want to speak today. She said, why? I said, because I don't want to speak. I want to fast speaking. So me too. I can enter and sit down in one corner. And all I'm singing is, Nearer my God to thee. Nearer to thee. Still all my song shall be nearer my God to thee. Nearer my God to thee. Nearer to thee. Embrace it. Inform your soul. In this season, not everything is beneficial. I think I preached it before I left here, Abby. Eh? First Corinthians chapter 6, Abby. That all things are lawful, but not everything is beneficial. And I told you, when you start to compete for the lawful, you want to satisfy the flesh. That's what you are looking for. When you are trying to define the boundary of what is permissible, what you are actually trying to do is you are trying to satisfy a dimension of the flesh without touching your conscience to know that you are in sin. And you are not in sin, actually, because there's no law of the commandment that makes that thing wrong. But you know that part of the reasons why you're trying to define the boundary so that you know where sin starts from is so that you know to what degree you can permit the flesh to find expression. So Paul said, all things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. Say fasting season. We have already declared 10 days to come meeting as fasting for all our churches. We are the ones hosting them. We can start. Yeah. Already you had one one week. From now to come, how many days are remaining? It's not up to 30. Just fast it. Just, it's not it. It's not a rule, oh. I've not declared church fasting. I've just declared fasting for those who can hear me. Church fasting is 10 days to come. That will be following you with, with card. Are you fasting today? Yes. <laughs> is anybody following me tonight? Do you, is, is that, do you understand me? In this season, you will love the constraint. And you will bless God for the people and the things that put the constraint on you. Are you is anybody understanding? You will love the constraint. But you will also bless God for the people and the things. Please let me beg you. Don't set out deliberately to constrain anybody. You are not the tempter. You are not the persecutor. If you do, you will re receive the reward of the tempter. Do you understand it? 
you receive the reward of persecutor. So don't do, I'm not saying, uh, because you know, these days we play about everything. So you see your brother cause they say, hey, that man, they said we should press our soul. I came to press your own. Sanushi them. Are you with me? No, don't. Don't. Recently, because of my own presses, my wife has had to take a lot of the grunt. But every time I'm speaking with her, I'm careful. I'm defining my words. The reason is very simple. When it comes to passing through the eye of the needle, only one man can pass by himself. Do you understand? Every man for himself. So we can encourage each other. So my wife stood in front of me today. And she said, I want to take a retreat. Seven days. I said, yeah. Sounds good. Because at that point, husband cannot retreat for wife. Wife cannot retreat for husband. Jesus said two will be lying down in bed. One will be taken. Ah, no. My own bed, two must be taken. No. I'm telling you. No, two must be taken. Because you think I'm supposing that one will be taken means I will go, my wife will stay. I'm not a fool. It's a season to fear. Do you understand? Only see the criteria of scripture now. Don't be excited. Fear. Because the fear will put a knife to your truth. The fear will lean you up. The fear will make you tell certain emotions to them who banker. What lies they come to. Do you understand? The emotions are real. The anger you feel is real. It can burn a house down. I get it up by I say, no. I know Satan I know, and I know the doors that he tries to use. This door, I lie, I close it. No go pass. So, just in case you notice that I'm not talking to you. Disclaimer. I'm not keeping malice. I'm fasting. Part of my fasting, my words. And you know I'm fasting. Because I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus oh, than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's presence. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause, I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast Than anything this world of 
than to be than to be the king of a vast domain and be held and be held in sin that's way and rather have Jesus than anything this world He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out the comb. He's all that my hungry spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain and be held and be held in sins that's way I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world Say it and to be This world of wars. So listen to this as I close. <laughs> Let me beg you. It's the season of the fast. Slim down. And I'm not talking about your physical weight. If it's necessary to slim down your physical weight, slim it. It needs to importantly be registered in this season. And what we're looking for is life. Give me John 17. John 17 from verse 1. Let me close. Mama, forgive me. I'll finish your time. Hmm? Have you forgiven me? Forgive me in front of church. Have you forgiven me? If you don't forgive me my sins in public, the Lord will not forgive you your sins in secret. <laughs> Hallelujah. I wish we started this reading from John 14, right? Now I'm saying that so that when you go home, you can read it. He spoke about life in various forms from John 14 to John 17. When, when he was done speaking with them in John 16, then he said certain things that threatened some things in John chapter 5. We don't have the time for John chapter 5 today. But let's read just a few verses here. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Please hear me. Every time I've read this in the most recent past, I feel like the hour in the hour has come. Of course, if you read this theologically, you might be saying, Jesus was saying, the time has come for me to leave. But I am conscious, thank you. Yeah. I'm conscious in my heart that every man must arrive in his lifetime to the place where he can say, the hour has come. And when a man says the hour has come, he must be speaking about the culmination of the purposes for which he was created. For Jesus was his death. When I stand now and I say the hour has come, I'm not thinking of dying. When I stand now and I say the hour has come, I feel like the entire reason why I was ever created is standing right in front of me. And I stop to say that so that you too 
If not now, when you travel to that place, you must be able to stand in that place and be able to also confidently say, Father, the hour has come. And what did Jesus say on it? He said, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Next verse. That's not my focus, so let's go. As thou hast given him what? Power over that he should give what? To as many. That means in Jesus' intention is to give eternal life to everybody God has given him. Right? Now, I, I, I hope or I believe that you were here when I was teaching out of 1 John and I showed you that the Bible said, you see, these things have I written on, unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that knowing that you have eternal life, you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And I spent a whole lot of time trying to explain how the second believing is different from the first believing. And that it is in the second believing that the love of the Father is triggered. And when the love of the Father is triggered, what John 5 reveals is that the Father begins to show you what work he's working. Because at that point, then you enter into the rest of God. Because the rest of God is take my yoke upon you. And I took the time out of John chapter 5 to show you that when you enter into the rest of God, you cannot even determine the extent of work you do. You can't determine to make it more spectacular than what the Father has revealed to you. Because Jesus said, and the Father will show the Son greater works than this, than you may marvel. That means the greatness of the works, even the greatness of the works, are not determined by the Son. That means that this is not an ambitious dream of some young set of believers who want to prove themselves to be better and greater than everybody else. Because in the day when that love of the Father meets up with us and we are able to see very clearly the things that the Father is doing. Because the restraint now is a restraint of sight. And when life comes, the first thing that will be reconciled is sight. We'll suddenly be able to see exactly what he's doing. You know right now, oh, let's get to committee. That you may be able to test what the will of the Lord is. So right now we're still in the dispensation of testing what his will is. But when the fullness of that conformity comes, what happens is that what the Father is doing becomes clear to us. To do anything else or anything less or anything more will now be our definition of sin. I wish you heard me. Because at that point, when you stand in front of a circumstance, you know exactly what the Father will have you do and you know to what extent. So, like I said in Zaria, Jesus walked to a pool. The Bible says, and there lay in there a, a large crowd of impotent folk waiting for the stirring of the waters. Jesus didn't come there, open his arms and say, everybody go. Because what the Father revealed is mercy on that man who's been here for 38 years. He walks up to that man and mercy because there was no faith in the man. The moment Jesus stood in front of him, all he was thinking about is, sir, if you actually want to help me, wait with me until there's a selling of water so that you can run there and throw me because I have no man. Jesus looked at me and said, we talk about man. I beg, carry your mat and go and while the guy was still stretching to carry his mat, Jesus left through a different road. That's where the story in John 5 started. So by the time the guy even recovered, he didn't know who asked him to take his mat. But it was a Sabbath day and he was carrying his mat. And the useless Pharisees, can you say, they can see far, you see. They were not, they, hey, 38 years, how are you walking? No, their concern is why are you carry mat on Sabbath day? Somebody has not finished healing. The Lord, the Sabbath is in front of him. The man, Kukuma said, the man who healed me told me to carry mat. I don't know whether it's inside the mat that the lameness is. The man now dropped it on the ground and followed the mat there. My brother, leave me alone. No. I beg you. You can keep your Sabbath law. Whatever the consequences, we will meet later. <clears throat> I 
But this is the emphasis. P, that he went there. A large multitude of impotent folk. And the Bible says that as the father had eternal life in himself. So he's given to the son to have eternal life in him. So if Jesus had opened his arms and said all this place clear. It would have still happened. And yet there was a discipline of the constraint of obedience in the soul. That made that he walked straight to who God sent him. Did the work God sent him. That means that even the size of how grand the work we will do is, we can't determine. So this cannot be a pursuit for some power hungry, prominence seeking. No. It is that the earth deserves the witness of the father again. And the only way to witness him accurately is to see what he's doing and replicate it. So the moment eternal life comes, the first thing that is restored is sight. The father loves the son and he shows the son whatever the father is doing. So when Jesus said in John 14, if a man loves me, he will keep my commandments. Then the father will love him and I and the father will come and make our abode with him. So Jesus was actually saying, when you cross that threshold in your soul, whereby the keeping of the commandments you are proven that you will do nothing outside of the will of God. Then at that point, the father comes to you and he reveals himself to you. It was in that context that Judas asked him, and said, how will you reveal yourself to us and not to the world? So the claim to have Jesus and the claim that he's alive is not complete until we are seeing him and the world cannot. He said, because I live, you will live also. Everything about the writings of John is eternal life. Everything, I'm feeling like it's now that we're doing the camp meeting, eternal life. It's now. Everything in those writings was speaking about love. Life. So take me back to John 17. I'm closing. Because in the midst of the press of your soul, you must also be able to say, ah, you put the one to six together. Can you put? Well done. Okay. Listen, in the press of all of it, in the press of all of this, in the midst of the constraint in your soul, you must always remember that the target is so that all that belongs to Jesus will be mine. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And by that, you prove that you are my disciples. That means discipleship is not complete until fruit is much. This word spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Verse 2. As thou hast given him what? Power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is the best definition of eternal life you're about to see. And this is life eternal. What? The and yes to know here is not to know about. It's to be united with. That's what I just explained as sight. And this is life eternal. That they may know thee. Do you understand? So I and the Father will make our abode with you. That's that knowledge. To know thee the one true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou sent. Verse 4. I have what? Glorified thee on earth. How did you do it Lord Jesus? Oh my God. No, talk, talk now. Eh? How, how did you do it? That means everything you revealed, I did. Everything you revealed, I did. Everything you revealed, I did. Everything you wrote concerning me, 
I didn't rest until I fulfilled. I've glorified thee on earth. I've finished the work that thou givest me. Verse 5. Let's go. 5. Quickly. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. The glory which I had with thee before the world was. Next verse. That's exclusive to Jesus. Let's see. Look at this. I have what? Manifested thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. That means they used to be in the world. You selected them. You gave them to me. I manifested your name to them. Zine they were. And you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now, they have known that all things, whatsoever thou hast given me, are of thee. For I have given unto them the words that you have given me. Oh no, wait. Go back. Previous verse. If we don't illustrate this, you'll miss it. Please get up. Look at this. Now they have known. Previous verse. That all things whatsoever thou hast given unto me came from you. Next verse. For I have given unto them I'm sharing my sweet. Did I share it to you? See, but these are days to spoil illustration. <laughs> give them, give them. I've given unto them the words which thou givest me. And what? And have known surely that and they have believed. Stop. That means to know Jesus and believe him. You see that second believing we're talking about? Is to receive by experience the words that the Father sent through him. Now, if you don't experience it, your faith is still in question. You can profess that you have faith until the day it is tried. That means faith must go beyond confession to profession. It must become your life. You must have experienced, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You must have experienced enough for Satan to stand in front of you and tell him, see, try something else. This God, I mean, union with him. And if there's anything to seek out of eternal life, is that experience. Next verse. And I believe that thou sent. Next verse. Let's do a few more verses. I'm, I'm almost out of here. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. I wish I can get to 21. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are dying. Next verse. 10. 10, 10, 10. And all mine are dying. And dying are mine. And I am glorified in them. Next verse. And now I'm no more in the world, but what? And I am come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be us. I see the subject of oneness. That means I was on earth, you were in heaven, but we were one. Now I am coming to you in heaven. Keep them through your name. He's going to say something about the name. Because he will tell you that the father, by the name he has given to him, the father preserved him and worked through him. Then he said, by that same name, keep them. Now, please take note that at that time, God had not highly exalted him and given him a name. So the name you're speaking about was not even the authority in the name that he gave us at his resurrection. Please follow I want to explain that one today. Let's leave it. Can you see? It? While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13. Look at this. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have, that they might 
have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. And the world hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. Next verse 15. 15. I pray not that thou shouldest. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Next verse. They are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. 17. Separate them unto yourself. Through your truth. Your word is truth. Even as thou hast sent me into the world, even so. Ah, no, no, no. I wish you heard it. Eh? That the way the Father sent Jesus is the same way Jesus has sent us. That means the authority the Father sent Jesus with is the same authority Jesus bequeathed to us to send us. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, And for their sakes, what? Stop. That means for their sake, I sought the truth of your word and I live by it. Sanctify them to yourselves, to yourself, by thy truth. Your word is truth. For their sake, I sanctified myself. That means for their sake, I sought the principle of your word and I lived by it. So that they will also see how they can seek the principle of your word and live by it. Next verse. 20 and 21. And I'll stop there. Oh my God. Neither pray I for these alone. I find it very comforting that Jesus added this sentence. Because you see, some overzealous theologian would have woken up and said to you, he was only talking about the apostles. But the Bible said, Jesus said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me. That means I qualify. That means this qualification of the passage of his name, the passage of his power, the passage of his word, the passage of his trust, and the giving of eternal life was not only for the apostles, but for every one of us who have come to believe. He said that they all may be one. Stop. What do we use this for? Isn't that the scripture we use in Can? This is our Can scripture now. That they all may be one. Uh -uh. Let me help you understand it. So Jesus was saying, because before he said that they may be one in us. You know he had said that they may be one in us. Okay, stop. So Jesus was saying, I was on the earth. You were in heaven. We operated as one. Now I'm coming back to you. Yamsan, and they are going to be there. Let them be one in us. That means the same access I had to you while you were in heaven and I was on earth is the same access they should have with you. Then he was saying, and let that happen generation after generation. Are, are, are you understanding it? As each passing generation goes into heaven, let there be a unity between that which is divine and that which is So that when I say, when, when I say, what, what's that song? Your presence is heaven to me. I'm not talking about when I come to church, I feel like I'm in heaven. No, I'm talking about the fact that I live consciously, knowing that me and heaven are in sync. So I set my thinking on the things that are above. So that as I'm going about every day, I'm thinking, what is heaven trying to do here? Because if I don't set, if I don't set my mind there, what will happen is that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. My realities will be limited even though heaven is excited about releasing eternal life to me. 
He said that they all may be one. As thou father art in me and I in them that they also may be one in us that the world may believe. That means the ultimate point that gets the Gentiles to say the Lord has done great things for them. I thought we were coming from Psalm 126 together. The ultimate point is when we arrive at the oneness with the Godhead that makes us do the works that we see heaven doing. That means there's a great harvest coming. But the great harvest is waiting for a step up in the operation of eternal life. Because you can't blame the world for not believing our present gospel. I wish you heard me. Let us frankly and sincerely tell ourselves what is frankly and sincerely true. That possibly 90 to 95% of us who sit in church today are only in church because we were born around Christian families. While we are thankful for the choice God made in us, because how we know God has made the choice in us is that he has stepped up our hearing of the word of faith beyond the traditional threshold that makes us think that, okay, now our children too must be Christians. It means that there's a boundary of darkness that must be broken. And it is kept by a culture that makes the world believe today that all this you are talking about Jesus Christ is because you are lucky that a Christian gave birth to you. There's only possibly a 5% of us whose original roots were not Christian, at least by nomenclature. And there's a witness that must be left with the world. And that witness Jesus spoke about is bound to our unity with the Father. So the question now is, what would you rather seek? Let me ask the question again. So what would you rather seek? I'd rather seek an operational oneness with the Father that brings the world to believing that God sent Jesus. And the world's believing comes because Jesus is still alive. I wish you heard me. So that I'm not telling them the stories of what Jesus did. They are watching my life and watching me replicate it. It is when they gather that I'm saying, ah, no, no, I'm not the beginning of this. You see that Jesus will have been telling you about this is, is his life. And let me say, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this consistent meditation is everything Satan is trying to steal from you. With your lack of food, lack of water, the troubles that worry your life, your children are missing, your DWG, uh, all those things that Satan is raising and stealing by anxiety the space in your soul. All he's trying to run away from is for you to arrive at the knowledge that this unity and oneness with God, when it happens, the world, see, even if the world doesn't give its life to Christ, it is ready to be judged. I wish you heard me. At least, the least, the building of the ark that Noah did, did was that the Bible said that he condemned this generation. That means if there's no act, there's no condemnation of a generation. So let me say it like this. This act that God left us to build, we have not built it. Because when we build it, there will be a firm witness on the earth that breaks the present threshold of darkness. That makes that Christianity is no longer a religion, it is life. They will look at us and know that the stories about Christ is not an ancient mystery. It's life. And that's what God seeks out of us. Is anybody following me? That breath means I can now rest. Saints, join me in the quest.
for eternal life. As we run towards the finishing line to defy the cultures of the earth and establish the kingdom of our God. That's four years of committing. I said, saints, join me in the quest for eternal life. As we run towards the finishing line to subdue the cultures of the earth and establish the kingdom of our God. Don't worry, I didn't write that as a rhyme from home. I said it now as I heard it. It tells you that there's something God has been building for the last four years. The culmination of it is what's about to hit us like a flood in this particular gambit. This gambit is like no, none other. At the risk of sounding like a broken record. You know, we see that almost every year. When the gambit is coming, you know, this gambit is going to be unique. See, this gambit is not like any other. In this gambit, one of the things you will notice is that we will pray like we have not prayed in any camp meeting. And it will not be a prayer that is scheduled. It will be that the cloud of heaven will rest upon us again and again. And every time that cloud descends, what will happen is that what we're speaking about like story will become a reality in the atmosphere. So we will stop to download it. I'm telling you, some of you will hold things that are intangible. You, you will know that you took hold of something that tangibility cannot pass. Four seasons are coming together in this season. The quest, eternal life, the finishing line. Four seasons are coming together in this season. What gave the grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to keep. Come sing it with my, my guys. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only in Jesus. For my life, for my life is only bound to me. Oh, how strange, oh, how strange and divine. I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but to Christ. To this I owe, my hope is holy. My life is wholly bound to His. Say to this I owe My hope is only Jesus For by my side, my side, 
the Savior, he will stay. I lay his display. Say the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness or rejoice. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. It has been paid. For Jesus blood suffered for my blood. And he was raised to overcome the grave. Say it again. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven. The future so the price it has been paid for Jesus' blood and so what for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave say to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus My sins have been forgiven. He said, My sins have been defeated. So sin has no hold, no dominion over me anymore. It cannot. All the chains are released. 
I can see I am free at night. For the chains are released. Oh, the chains are released. I can say I am free, yet not I, but through Christ. Now, this is the creed. With every breath, With every breath I long to follow Jesus. I long to follow Jesus. For he has said, For he has said that he will bring me home. I know he will renew me. I know he will renew until I stand, until I stand with joy before the throne. Before Say it again. With every, breath, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus. I long to follow Jesus. For he has said. I can sing all is mine yet not I but to Christ in me oh oh the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I Chains are released. I can sing. I am free. And when my race is complete, every time I say when the race is complete, I'm not looking at a finishing line. I'm looking at my body like this. Because when the race is complete, this body will give way house from heaven will envelope it. When the race is complete, I will know as I'm fully known. When the race is complete. Say when the race is gone. Still my lips. That's the testimony even in eternity. Say when the 
race is come. When the race is complete, my lips shall. acknowledge that it is you who is at work in us both willing and doing of your good pleasure please fulfill your good pleasure in us Lord we do not claim to be strong or to have any wisdom that is ours we do not claim to have any tact that is ours we don't even claim to have any spiritual record that is ours that should make us qualify for these things but because you paid the price in honor of the price that you have paid we insist that the fullness of eternal life will manifest in and through us. We insist, oh God, we insist that this weeping, this mourning that we feel, this groaning that exists inside of us, that we go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, sowing in our tears, we know that we will doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves with us and reaping in joy. And so, Lord, we commit tonight by the help of your spirit to never sow in the flesh. For the flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. And you said that the words that you speak unto us, they are spirit and they are life. Spirit is the realm. Life is the means, the power. We receive your words of life. And we receive the right to live eternal life. To the end, O oh God, that everything in and around us will see your glory come. That the world may know that you are alive and that we are your disciples indeed. Glorify your name in us. Let your name receive all the glory. Like the Lord Jesus, we stand today to say, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your name. Blessed be your name, Father. Blessed be your name, Father. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just want to read something that I wrote down some two Tuesdays or so ago, the last Tuesday that Pastor ministered before he, he traveled. He said, the accuracy of knowledge and events is not as important as sensitivity to times and seasons. The accuracy of knowledge and events is not as important as sensitivity to times and seasons. The reason why I'm, I'm reading this is so that we don't take lightly what we heard at the beginning, the burden that pastor was trying to pass. It's not enough to know, but to prepare for a season. The ten virgins knew that the bridegroom was coming. But five of them were sensitive to the times, knowing that they needed to carry extra oil. Hallelujah. I want to just re quickly read one, just a few verses in Matthew 24, from verse 15. Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken, by, spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Go back to verse 1, sorry. Let me just quickly read verse 1 and 2. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. 
Did you notice that? And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Meaning they were looking at the physical temple and he was trying to tell them, you are trying to show me the building. Can't you see in the spirit that there's something that is coming? Go to verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Verse 17. Let them which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him that is in the field return back to his clothes. Go back to verse um, 17 again. It says, let him which is on the housetop not come down. No, verse 16. I think that's, let him that be in Judea flee into the mountains. He's talking about this fasting that pastor is talking about. That you need to slim your life out of comfort. Because Judea, what's in Judea? Your house is in Judea. He says, flee to the mountains. Meaning there is that strait that God wants you to enter into because you discern the times. There's a manner of behavior that comes out of you by discerning the times and interpreting it. Yes, 17. He says, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. This season is a season where the things you used to do before is no longer going to be as usual. The comfort you used to enjoy before is, not, is no longer going to be as usual. And you know, because the Spirit will indicate in your heart the things you need to slim out of. Verse 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to his clothes. Can you see that everything is talking about leaving the usual place that of the pl usual place of comfort? Because there is a discerning of the times and the seasons. And John 15, when Jesus was talking about him being the vine, he said that verse 2 of John 15. He says that he that bears fruit, he will purge so you can bear more fruit. It, is, it didn't mean that you were not bearing fruit. It didn't mean that you were not bearing fruit. But there is a higher level that he's trying to break us into that requires the purging that requires the cutting off, that requires the cleaning. So you will see that in this season, the things that, like Pastor said, you had buried, the things that used to be your challenge, like, you know, you felt like it has been in the cooler, resting. In this season, it would heighten, it would come up to its highest manifestation. That weakness in you that, you are, that you've been struggling with, that you have been patching and managing, that strait that he's bringing us into is for it to climax and for you to still overcome it. And that's the breaking into that eternal life that pastor has been talking about, that God has been speaking to us about. So you will notice in this season that you'll be tempted unusually. Because pastor has taught us that when temptation comes, grace is withdrawn. And that's where the real test is a test. But the preparation, the discerning of the times is the preparation for that day of the manifestation. Because you cannot definitely stop it from coming. It will come. You can't pray, Lord, let this temptation pass. Jesus said, if it is possible... But there is a manner of stewarding by the sight of the reward that made that he was able to streamline his life. So this season for us is a season of preparation, is a season of consciousness of the season, is the season of test, is the season of passing the test 
So no matter how Satan rages to the highest point of it, you will withstand him because you know that this is the season for more. This is the season to break through. I read one more scripture, then we'll, we'll take our offering. First John 1. 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And the fullness of joy is the place where there is no limitation. Is a place of the fullness of life. Is the place where you're, you're, not, you're not in bondage to flesh. Because I realize that many times it is the frustration of flesh that makes us manifest flesh. The frustration of being caged in the flesh makes that that's your first reaction every time pressure is put upon you. It's actually a groaning that we don't understand. That instead of reacting with that, but because that life is not yet manifested, what is inside of us is rebelling against the pressure that is coming to us. But what we are using to respond is the flesh. So your first response is anger. Is a frustration of the fallen man. You are in a box. You want to, you know, manifest God, but every time there is a press on your soul, the first thing that comes out of you is that which it was recorded in First John two, when he says that if this is in you, that is in the world, then the love of God is not in you. And that's the warfare that we're in in this season. To be able to stand over that which has been a limitation to us for more than we can ever think about. Because God is about, he's serious about, you know, I know we have heard this thing. We have heard this thing over and over. But I, I tell you the truth, the season is palpable. The cloud is full. You can, you can tell that we're about to break through. And so, because you're about to break trees, like, I thought I had matured. How come this has befallen me? I thought I should have even, you know, I've journeyed. I love God. I've grown. How did I react like this? How did I respond to flesh at this height? Is the sign that we are close to the inheritance is the sign that the breaking point, we're at the brink of entering into that life that God has reserved for us. So we must still work this season with that body. I just came up to put back that body in place so we don't run off excitedly and forget that we, we just received the body. That body must put you in a straight. Straight is the gate and narrow is the path. So we must live narrowly in this season. And narrow means it's tight. You can't carry baggage in. Yeah. There's no space for excess. So there's a trimming that is happening by all means. God is more excited about us entering into this season that is just right, right ahead of us. So I want, us to, to, I want to encourage us to let this burden fuel our behavior our manner of life, how we steward this period of our lives as we await in hope the manifestation of the fullness of life. Hallelujah. The branch that bears fruit is going to purge. He's cleaning us in this season, but you must enter into the cleaning room 
So that place in First John that says our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. If that word fellowship sounds too basic to be the place where the production of that life is coming out of. We have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintalk.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast. You can also follow live services on www.mixlr.com slash the GLAJ.